her uh, microphone is muted whilst I give a presentation. And then obviously we can have the uh, questions and answers uh, once I'm finished uh, with, with the, the presentation. 100 years ago this month, on the 7th of March 1921, the Protests and Appeals Committee of the Irish Football Association, the IFA, met to schedule the replay of an Irish Cup semi-final tie between Dublin-based club Shelburne and Lorgan-based club Glenavon. And here is the Shelburne team from 1919, many of whom were still playing for the club in 1921. As the first match, which ended in a draw, had been played in Belfast, it was almost universally believed that the replay would be held in Dublin. The IFA Protests and Appeals Committee ruled it was too unsafe for matches to be played in Dublin due to the prevailing conditions caused by the Anglo-Irish War of Independence and Shelburne was ordered back to Belfast for the replay. The club refused to do so and was removed from the competition. Subsequently, Glenavon lost the Irish Cup final to Glentoran later in the month. And here is an image of Glen Torren uh, scoring the first of, of two goals in that match. The action to suspend Shelburne was roundly condemned by the Leinster Football Association and all associated with the game in Dublin. It was the catalyst that led to the secession of the Leinster body from the IFA and the formation of the Football Association of Ireland, the FAI, a few months later. Today I will look at the primary reasons for the cause of and maintenance of the schism in Irish soccer, which has been ongoing for 100 years. I will also compare the football example to other sports, most that have remained governed on an all Ireland basis since partition. Many believed from its earliest days that the IFA was biased in favour of Belfast and its surrounding areas. Soccer had gained a foothold in the north of Ireland before anywhere else. The IFA itself was founded in Belfast in 1880 and it's still headquartered there. It was established to govern soccer for the whole island of Ireland. And here is uh, John McAleary, the man most responsible for the introduction of soccer to Ireland and the IFA's first secretary. At the first meeting of the IFA, there were seven clubs in attendance, five from Belfast and two from Derry. Pictured is at Myola Park from Derry, the first winners of the Irish Cup in 1881. And here is an illustration of the first Irish international team from 1882, composed of players from four clubs in and around Belfast, who lost to England by a by almost remarkable scoreline, 13 goals to nil. It took until the 1890s before Leinster clubs were challenging the dominance of Ulster clubs. When the Leinster Football Association was founded in 1892, one of its founders, Thomas Kirkwood Hackett, criticised the IFA for the prejudice of five men of the IFA International Section Committee who selected teams preventing anyone outside the Belfast area being chosen to represent their country. As this table demonstrates, there certainly was a tendency for the IFA to select players playing for Ulster clubs for the senior Irish international team. The table lists all of the Irish international caps won from 1882 to 1921 with the exception of an international friendly between Ireland and Scotland in 1902 in aid of the Ibrox Disaster Fund, following the collapse of, stand, of, of a stand in Ibrox, killing 25 supporters, and the victory internationals held after the First World War. The caps are broken down based on the location of each player's club at the time of each international. Overall, 1,144 caps were awarded by the IFA over that time period, the vast majority of the caps going to players who played for clubs based in Ulster, 798. The IFA did not allow Irish players playing for overseas clubs to play for Ireland until 1899, with the exception of one player, Henry Lockhart, who was capped for Ireland in 1884 whilst attending Russell School in Lancashire. Irish players who played for overseas clubs won 270 caps between 1899 and 1921. Players playing for Dublin-based clubs received 75 caps in total from 1882 to 1921. That's averaging at just two caps out of 33 caps per year. Although soccer was more developed in Ulster at an earlier stage, professionalism was brought in sooner and there were more senior clubs in Ulster to choose from. The discrepancy between Ulster and, Lepsen, and Leinster representation was huge. Once Dublin clubs became more competitive, 
and started to win Irish Cups, the Blue Ribbon competition, and compete in the Irish Football League, the representation on the international team did increase. It was not commensurate with their achievements though. In 1908, the two Irish Cup finalists were Bohemians and Shelburne, and pitched is the Bohemians team who won that trophy. Five international caps were won between the two clubs that year, three the following year. The same clubs reached the final again in 1911, and again just five people from those clubs were called up for international duty. After the First World War, just one cap was won by a player playing for Dublin club before the split of 1921, Ned Brooks from Shelburne, playing against Scotland in 1920. Shelburne won the Irish Cup in 1920. In that same period, 23 caps were won by players playing for Ulster-based clubs. Another bone of contention was the choice of venue for international matches playing in, played in Ireland. Of the 54 international matches played in Ireland from 1882 to 1921, just six were played in Dublin. The other 48 were played in Belfast. And here's an image of action from the first ever soccer international match played in Dublin when Ireland played England at Lansdowne Road on 17th of March 1900. And here's the Irish team that played that day. It was also believed that the Leinster and Munster Football Associations were offered just token representation on the IFA Council and its different subcommittees. As well as having a few seats on the IFA Council, the main governing authority, Leinster and Munster also had reasons to complain about the representation on the different subcommittees of the IFA. Here is a list of all of the IFA subcommittee makeup from the 1909-1910 season to, through to the 1920-21 seasons, with each committee membership broken down by divisional association. In most cases, membership of subcommittees consisted of over half the delegates hailing from the Northeast region. The composition of practically every, every subcommittee of the IFA had the bulk of its members coming from either the Northeast, the Northwest, and the Mid Ulster regions, with just a smattering of delegates, if any, from the other regions. Leinster had overtaken the Northeast as the largest divisional association in 19, 1913, and yet its representation on the parents' body subcommittees did not reflect this. For example, in 1913, the Protests and Appeals and Reinstatements Committee was composed of seven members, three from the Northeast, just one from Leinster. The International Committee, a vital one due to its choosing of the national team was also composed of seven members in 1913, which was one from Leinster and three from the North East. The other three delegates were from the North West, Mid Ulster and Fermanagh and Western, making it very difficult for one solitary and rules revision committees. The Munster Football Association had no representation on any subcommittee in 1913. The dominant Northeast region, as well as having three members on the protests and appeals and reinstatements and international committees, had four out of eight members on the finance committee, three out of six on the emergency committee, five out of five on the senior league clubs protests and appeals committee, two out of three on the rules revision committee, and two out of six on the advisory committee. By 1921, very little had changed. All committees were dominated by North East representatives, including the Senior League Club's Protest and Appeals Committee, which had five out of eight members compared to two from Leinster. There was very little that Leinster delegates could do to halt the decision of that committee to stop Shel Shelburne from being forced back to, to Belfast, considering their numerical disadvantage. Many also believed the IFA was not interested in helping the game grow outside of Ulster. According to historian Neil Garnham, in 1910, the IFA decided not to interfere in the project of setting up a Connacht FA to encourage the game in the west of the country. There was a belief that grants were more readily available for clubs and associations in Ulster too. For example, a motion at an IFA council meeting in 1913 was defeated that the Munster Association be given a grant of £20 to keep the game alive in Munster. Yet the same council had no problem in granting £25 to a council member, J.M. Small, for a testimonial in his honour at the very next council meeting. Defending against the accusations of bias, many from the North countered that it was from Belfast and its surrounding areas that soccer grew. 
there were more competitive clubs in Belfast. It embraced professionalism long before everyone else did. And the success of the Belfast clubs in league and cup competitions was testament to the superiority of football in Belfast. This table here, it shows all of the winners of the Irish Cup from 1881 to 1921. Um, and so as, as highlighted, Ulster teams won the competition every year, except for five occasions in this time period. They're the ones uh, highlighted in bold. Gordon Highlanders are the only British Army team to win the competition, with Shelburne winning on three occasions and Bohemians winning once. And this table here demonstrates Ulster dominance even more. Since the founding of the Irish Football League in 1890, only, only teams from Ulster have won the competition. It could also be argued that the attendance record at IFA meetings of representatives from Leinster and Munster was poor in the extreme, justifying the decision not to grant them additional representation on key committees. The attendance record of Leinster delegates from 1910 to 1921 for IFA council and subcommittee meetings was very poor, with the exception of the International Committee, where the Leinster representatives attended the bulk of the meetings. It could be maintained that the meetings were held in Belfast, making it considerably more difficult for people located elsewhere to attend and given, and given the makeup of each committee, Leinster representatives could be forgiven for feeling like token representatives with little opportunities available to affect any meaningful changes. Some of the delegates representing Munster and for Man and Western were not even from those regions. It was seen as too impractical to travel to Belfast for meetings. Thomas Moles, editor of the Belfast Telegraph and Belfast Ulster Unionist MP, served on the IFA Council and some of its subcommittees as a delegate for both Munster and for Man and Western at different junctures. The paltry attendance record did not help Leinster's case though in attempting to gain more representation. Larry Sheridan was Leinster representative on the Protest and Appeals Committee from 1910 to 1913. In that period, 46 meetings were held by that committee. Sheridan attended just three. National politics did play a significant part in driving a wedge between the, those governing the game, North and South. The fractious political atmosphere that engulfed the nation leading up to partition and beyond impacted deeply on soccer in Ireland most clearly illustrated to the mass riots involving nationalist-leaning um, Belfast Celtic and the unionist-leaning Linfield and Glentoran clubs. And here is a Belfast um, Celtic squad from 1912. The vicious sectarian riots at the September 1912 match between Belfast Celtic and Linfield and the March 1920 match between Belfast Celtic again and Glentoran demonstrated that politics and soccer were closely intertwined. And pictured as an illustration of the riot between Belfast Celtic and Linfield in 1912, when over 100 people were injured as rival crowds fought against each other with sticks, stones and knives. Belfast Celtic, given the violence occurring in Belfast in the early years of the 1920s, withdrew altogether from soccer for four years, from 1920 to 1924. The club, the leading nationalist club in Northern Ireland, disbanded completely in the late 1940s. Many of the key administrators in Belfast were unionist in outlook, including the chairman who oversaw the split, James Wilton. Wilton was secretary of the Derry Division of the Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF, during the Home Rule crisis before the First World War. He was elected as an Ulster Unionist councillor to the Derry Corporation in 1923, and in 1935 he became Lord Mayor of Derry City. Major Spencer Chichester, the IFA's first president, Although not a, not a particularly political man himself, he did have close family unionist links. His grandson, James Chidester Clark, became the second last Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. The second president of the IFA, the Marquis of Londonderry, was a leading opponent of Home Rule, who once claimed in the House of Lords that the one and only pledge that I, give, that I gave to my constituents was that to my dying day, I would stand by and maintain the union between England and Ireland. He played a prominent role in Ulster Day, 28th of September 1912, when many Ulster Unionists signed the Solomon League and Covenant in opposition to the Third Home Rule Bill. He was the second person to sign the Covenant in Belfast City Hall after Sir Edward Carson. A manifestation of their unionism and Protestantism could be seen by the refusal to countenance football on Sundays. Football on the Sabbath day was still not an option, even for World Cup matches in the 1950s. 
Such reservations did not play in the minds of nationalist-leaning clubs like Belfast Celtic, nor would soccer administrators from Leinster. One of the first decisions of the newly formed FAI was to sanction football on Sundays. There was also belief that the IFA was more prone to side with unionist-leaning than nationalist-leaning clubs. The treatment of Belfast Celtic to a number of episodes, particularly in 1920, strengthened disbelief. The flag incident during the amateur international between Ireland and France in Paris in February 1921 also left a sour taste, with many in the South, seen as another example of the anti-nationalist slant of the IFA. At a match that Ireland won by two goals to one, an attempt was made by, by a section of the crowd to have the Irish team walk behind Sinn Féin flags on taking the pitch. The IFA officials at the match, in conjunction with the French authorities, prevented this from happening and had the people responsible removed from the ground. At the subsequent IFA council meeting, several Dublin representatives pointed out that politics had never been introduced into football in Dublin, and much da damage had been done as a result of the incident. It was claimed that in Dublin, soccer was not favoured by some of the community, and this incident had given rise to much criticism. The incident might have been the means of wiping soccer out of Leinster. Players were leaving soccer in Dublin and going over to rugby and other codes. The incident had placed the soccer officials in a very awkward position. The catalyst that led to Leinster leaving the IFA, Shelburne being forced back to Belfast for an Irish Cup semi-final replay tie in 1921, was caused by the Protest and Appeals Committee, believing it being too unsafe for teams from Belfast to travel to Dublin because of the War of Independence. Although most on the committee were aligned on their news from Belfast newspapers, newspapers that, that were eager to condemn atrocities in Dublin and ignore the more widespread sectarian violence in Belfast, it beggars belief that the concerns of people travelling from Dublin to Belfast was never taken into consideration. And here's an illustration of a riot in Belfast in 1920. Many cite the partition of Ireland as the main reason for the split in Irish soccer. This does not hold up under scrutiny. Although the Government of Ireland Act came into law in December 1920, Ireland was not officially partitioned until May 1921, when it was still rejected by most people on the island. Up until 1922, partition was an administrative inconvenience. It bore little impact on the lives of people. The border that was established in May 1921 between the two parts of Ireland had not yet become a frontier between two mutually antagonistic states. Sinn Féin practically ignored partition as an issue up until the truce with the British government in July 1921. In 1922, and when the new government established in the South, after the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in December 1921, the effects of partition became more apparent. Both Irish governments were forced to devote much attention to relations with each other and to the questions of the boundary between their two states. It was an accident of fate that the partition of Ireland happened the same time as the partition in Irish football. Football administrators were as blind and oblivious to the effects of partition as everyone else was when it came into being in 1921. In all correspondence between the IFA and FAI during the 1920s and 1930s, when attempts to heal the division were made, the partition of Ireland was rarely mentioned as an issue. In one conference in 1923, FAI delegate Larry Sheridan, in refusing to play second fiddle to the IFA, did make the remark, we can't get past the sentimental point of the office being in Dublin. There is a strong political bias in this matter. And if we send representatives up to Belfast, Munster will go on, out from under us, as the political feeling was such at the moment that it would not agree to being governed from Belfast. It is true the many in the South felt pressurised by the GEA's war on foreign gains, its cultural nationalism campaign that did not abate after the Free State was formed. Soccer, a game with many nationals as players and administrators could not be governed from the north. For the game to survive in the 26 counties, particularly in areas where the game had not previously flourished, it was felt separation from the IFA was the best course to take. Separation from the parent body did see the game spread very quickly in the free state in the 1920s and to most parts of the fledgling state. It established an FAI Cup and league competition immediately. Eight teams entered the new Football League of Ireland just six were in the IFA-controlled Irish Football League. At the inaugural FAI Cup final in 1922, 15,000 were in attendance. The match went to a replay, attracting 10,000 spectators. By contrast, 
There's 5,000 people attended the IFA Irish Cup final that year. Separation also allowed the FAI to play a vital role in promoting Ireland and the new state to the world. Here is the first FAI selected Irish international team, an amateur team, to play on Irish soil against the USA in 1924. And here is the Italian team taking a fascist salute in Lansdowne Road in 1927, moments before the first FAI selected Irish full international match was played in Dublin. The experience garnered from governing its own affairs once the FAI was formed provided the southern body with the confidence and desire to maintain its independence. The IFA may have wished to be one governing body for all of Ireland again after the split had happened. This was never a realistic option considering how far the FAI had progressed in the 1920s. The, IF, the FAI from then on believed it to be an equal partner to the, F, to, to the IFA. Although only recently established, it governed an area far greater in size than that governed by the IFA. It is simplistic to believe the FAI did not reunify with the IFA because of the new political makeup of the country. There are many incidents showing the IFA would have readily accepted reunion on the basis of equality. Partition did feature as an issue in talks held in 1932, brought up by the FAI, as it felt the IFA should, should, should not be representative of the whole of Ireland on the International Football Association Board, the body that still decides on the rules of the game to this day, as it just had jurisdiction for Northern Ireland. Wilton, the IFA chairman, curtly replied, you never put yourself in the position to be on any international board. Shall I tell you why? Because you insisted on being either a dominion or a republic. He received a sharp rebuke from the FAI. This is a, that is a political matter, we have not yet, unfortunately, altogether a Republic of Ireland to help us. You do not know what Republic means. When we have a Republic in Ireland, it will be a Republic, and you people of the six counties will not be allowed to use the name of Ireland, the name of the 32. Crucially, when the political status of Ireland was brought up, it was not mentioned as a reason for both associations to remain divided. It was primarily used as a tool by the FAI to gain international recognition or to have equality of status in all matters relating to football on the island of Ireland. At that same fractious meeting of 1932, one IFA delegate remarked, I would still be inclined to hang my head for the reason that we as Irishmen are divided and we cannot meet England, Scotland or Wales as the United Ireland. My principal reason for being in favour of, that, of the, the Joint Control Board is that it might lead to closer association and perhaps a united association. To which Joe Wickham of the FAI replied, this conference is, I'm sure, anxious to bring about what is the earnest desire of all clubs in the North and in the South, and that is harmony, goodwill, and the feeling of international teams worthy of the name of Ireland. We must all recognise that we are part and parcel of one country. When the FAI was established in 1921, it did not want to govern for the 26 counties that would become the Irish Free State. It wanted to govern for the whole island of Ireland, just like the IFA. It received a huge boost soon after its foundation, from the Nationals Falls and District League in Belfast, who asked to be affiliated to the new body. In total, 23 clubs from the Falls and District League, the Falls and League District, um, affiliated to the FAI, including Alton United, a team that comprised of many players from Belfast Celtic, still absent from football. Alton United went on to win the FAI Cup in 1923, and here is the team that defeated Shelburne in the final. The FAI was able to lay claim that it, unlike the IFA, was a truly all-Ireland body. It did so in an application it made to FIFA for membership in March 1922, stating that it was the governing body of the Leinster Football Association, the Belfast and District Football Association, the Athlone and District Football Association, and the Munster Football Association. It only relinquished its right to govern for the whole island of Ireland in order to gain acceptance into the FIFA fold in 1923. If we compare soccer to the other sporting body that divided along partitioners lines soon after the formation of both Irish jurisdictions, the National Athletic and Cycling Association of Ireland, NACA, there are marked differences in the reasons for the divide in athletics and cycling that bedeviled those sports for decades. And here's a, a ladies cycling race in Cork in the 1920s. NACA was strongly influenced by the GEA. Its president, John J. Keane, was an active GEA member. The division and bitterness the sport endured for decades was related to politics and very specifically to partition. 
NACA campaigned for decades to resist partition in a sporting context, a campaign that led to its wilderness at Olympic Games for over 20 years. In a pamphlet NACA published in 1946, entitled Partition in Irish Athletics, it stated, the NACA claims the support of all national associations in its stand for a united Ireland. Its athletes have made big sacrifices for this ideal, and its officials have been criticised and insidiously obstructed by those who are opposed to the best interests and tradition of the Irish nation. The primary reason I firmly believe that caused the Irish soccer split was internal politics, the struggle for power within soccer in Ireland. The conferences held between the two bodies from 1923 to 1932 show this battle for power clearly. The conference in 1923, the first since the split, was a bad-tempered affair, with the IFA offering too little and the FAI demanding too much for an agreement to be reached. In the IFA annual general meeting shortly afterwards, Wilton did hold out an olive branch, remarking there might be a development which might result in reunion. He could assure them all that they would be the first to make every possible effort to bring together the North and the South. He could not see why Irishmen could not settle their differences, at least in the realm of sport. They were too good sportsmen to allow anything to prevent the welfare of sport in the old country. And he had every hope that in the very near future, their differences would be amicably settled. He assured them that the council of the FEI would leave no stone unturned to have the reunion on an accomplished fact before another annual meeting. To allow the applause, he concluded with a wish that before their next annual meeting, they would have the United Ireland. Wilton stance reflected an anomalous position that existed within unionism, whereby unionist politicians, such as Thomas Moles, Thomas McMullen, and John Andrews, sought as much divergence politically between the North and the South on the one hand, and actively sought unity in sport on the other. Andrews, the Northern Ireland Minister for Labour and future Prime Minister, speaking at an Irish hockey union dinner, commented on the peculiar scenario where Irishmen had, throughout the generations that had gone, they had rarely if ever ceased fighting with one another. And side by side with that, they as sportsmen found that they had always been good pals and the very best friends. For Irishmen, no matter in what part of Ireland they lived, but the sooner they learned to put the spirit that was in sport into the public dealings with one another, the better. It would be for each and all of them. At a conference between both Irish soccer bodies in March 1924, at the first meeting in Belfast, the IFA offered the FAI the, se the selection and control of international matches to be vested in a committee of equal representation from the FAI and the IFA, with the existing chairman of the IFA as chairman of that committee, the control of the Irish Senior Cup to be dealt with by a management committee of equal representation from the FAI and the IFA, the control of the Irish Junior Cup to be dealt with by a committee of management consisting of equal representation from both bodies, the FAI to deal entirely with their own internal affairs, that is with offences by their clubs and all matters which might be best be described by the word internal, divisional associations from the North and South to have equal representation in the Council of the new body, and meetings of the Council to be held on alternately in the North and the South. This was a huge concession from the IFA to a body that was less than three years old. It was reported that the IFA's offer more or less took the breath away of the Free State delegates, who were so pleased and surprised with the terms. And here's an article from the Irish Times after the first meeting, claiming a provisional settlement had been reached. However, when the delegates reported back to the FAI Council, much to the astonishment of the IFA, the deal was not ratified. The primary objection was, it was that the Northern Chairman would be the permanent chairman of the joint body on selecting the international team. The IFA wanted total equality of status. Sorry, the FAI wants total equality of status. At a conference in 1932 between the IFA and the FAI, the IFA agreed to alternating the chairman each year between the FAI and the IFA. Finances would also be shared equally. It looked like agreement was finally at hand to reunify the sport in Ireland. However, just as, as it happened in 1924, the IFA did not ratify the deal as it wanted one of the IFA's two seats on the international board, something the IFA was unwilling to consent to. This was the last major effort at unification before talks commenced again during the Troubles in the 1970s. The IFA, the fourth oldest football association in the world, looked to maintain its sta status to concede as little as it could. The IFA ultimately would not agree on a settlement 
unless it was on total equality, right down to a seat on the international board. In many ways, the conference has failed because the IFA was too cautious in relinquishing its power, being forced by the English FA to do so at different junctures. The FAI also contributed significantly to the downfall of the conferences, particularly in 1924 and 1932. The Southern body, by adding additional demands just as agreement was close at hand, ensured the collapse of the conferences. The IFA, who genuinely did want a settlement, could rightly be forgiven for thinking that Southerners were not serious about amalgamation. It was clear from the conferences held and throughout internal meetings and comments to the press by both associations at the time that the primary reason for maintaining the schism was the struggle for power internally and not to change political status of Ireland. Despite there being a number of occasions where reunification has come close, all efforts failed and soccer in Ireland remains just as the country does politically, divided north and south. Here is a list of the sporting bodies that I've compiled that are currently governed on a 32 county basis in Ireland. Most sports that existed before partition, such as rugby, Gaelic games, hockey and golf, ignored the new international political boundary created by partition and remained all Ireland bodies afterwards. Cricket actually became united after partition in 1923 under the Irish Cricket Union banner. Sports reaction to partition demonstrates that the political partition of Ireland was not followed by a social and cultural partition. Although required to be mindful of the new political realities on the island, most sports were neither compelled to nor desired to split along political lines. Soccer was no different to other sports and that it, in that it was not compelled to split along political lines. It chose to split for internal political reasons primarily rather than the political partition of Ireland. The sporting example shows that ambiguity, fluidity and uncertainty were common features of the Irish border, which provoked many responses from sporting and other bodies, the most common one being to remain governed on an all-Ireland basis in post-partition Ireland. Sports that remain governed on an all-Ireland basis adapted to partition by incorporating inoffensive and neutral flags, anthems and emblems, such as the Four Provinces flag, tailored to accommodate diverse political and cultural interests. Unlike in soccer, those sports democratised internal governance structures to limit the scope for divisions and were mindful of the geographic dimensions within their organisations. A federalist approach to internal governance was the clearest path to internal unity. The differences with the internal governance structures of soccer up to the split in 1921, where control was firmly rooted in Belfast, are striking. Most sports that remained united also did not have the identity issues faced by soccer, which was played and supported in large numbers by Protestants and Catholics, Unionists and Nationalists from different classes. Sports such as hot rugby, hockey, cricket and bowls were primarily administered by Protestants from the upper classes of society. And here is uh, the Northern Ireland Prime Minister, James Craig, meeting the English team before an hockey international against Ireland and Belfast. The GA is a pan-nationalist association dominated by Catholics that little to encourage Protestant and Unionist membership. Soccer, like athletics and cycling, had to cater for different religions and classes. This certainly provided challenges in maintaining unity for those sports and contributed to their ultimate division. On the other hand, sports such as boxing and horse racing were able to incorporate members from multiple backgrounds without dividing, showing that division in soccer cannot be explained by identity issues alone. And here's a, a not further list I've compiled of sports that are not governed on a Turkish county basis today, but most of them you will see have been established since the partition of Ireland. Whilst the political climate in Ireland at the time and issues over identity were contributory factors, the difference in internal governance structures between soccer and other sports provides the most compelling evidence of why most sporting organisations remained all Ireland bodies and soccer did not after the partition of Ireland. So if you want to find out more about this, um, as uh, Jason mentioned, my book, The Irish Soccer Split, it's actually, it's been uh, uh, reprinted in, in paperback format and should be available in the next couple of weeks, um, but it's still available on hardback or uh, through uh, ebook if you want to find out more. So I'll turn you back to uh, Jason. Thanks very much, Cormac. It was really enjoyable. Uh, and there's a few um, a few nice comments coming through in the chat function as well and a few questions. Um, so I'll maybe kick off with, well, I had two questions. You answered one of them and then another one came to mind. 
My first question is, what on earth is road bowling? Yeah, that's, it's actually very common in Cork and even in Armagh. So it's, uh, it's, it's bowling on a road. It's in a, usually a, a rural road and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's quite, quite popular in, in certain pockets in Ireland, including the north as well. It's said Armagh and, and other pockets in Tyrone as well. Never heard of it. Um, but my, my, my second question is, and I'll go then to some questions from the audience. Um, if football's governance had been in Dublin before 1921 rather than in Belfast, do you think we would have seen a split? Um, and that, that's, that actually has been brought up. That was actually brought up, I think, on the, the Year 21 podcast um, 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 from BBC there. Um, yeah, I think that is a very, it is a good point that most sports were governed from Dublin at the time. Like Dublin you know, was considered a capital of Ireland uh, at the time, even, even though obviously uh, um, you know, many from the North East um, didn't want to ban to do Dublin from, from a political point of view. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, to be honest, I, 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 I'd say, I think the only reason why this, this split happened, really, is, is because of uh, internal reasons. I think the other reasons, like the political partition of Ireland, even the sectarianism, which which wasn't that big, I would think overall, I, I don't think they were particularly a sectarian organisation, the IFA. Um, I think they they got a good over, they would have got over those issues if they had, they uh, if if the IFA had treated Leinster and, and other power bases in the game with equality, like like as I've demonstrated in other sports, like in hockey and in, in golf and in rugby, where where a lot of a lot of the kind of um, divisional uh, kind of work was left to the, each province and there was less kind of avenue for, for uh, um, division. If that had happened, there wouldn't have been a split or, and it certainly would have been healed if, if, uh, if it wasn't such bad blood between both bodies. Um, but it's, it's very hard to say. We, so we don't know what the dynamic would have been if it was headquartered in Dublin. Would, um, like in hockey, they comp often complain that, you know, everything was drawn from Dublin um, and, you know, we never got a look in sideways from Belfast, but they, they, they actually did admit it, it improved after partition. Um, cricket also didn't want to unify in Belfast because they felt all oh, the international matches go to Dublin, you know, the, 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 the team was selected from Dublin. It was only after 1923 when Leinster really went out of their way to select uh, players from Belfast and, and, and actually have Belfast as a venue for international matches that they had decided to actually uh, unify in 1923. Um, so it, it really depends. We don't know what the dynamics would have been. Um, but, but if soccer was governed from Dublin, and they treated Belfast with respect and treated them well, it wouldn't have been a split, I believe, yeah. Uh, Claire Hacklett asks an interesting question, which, uh, well, first of all, she says, fascinating talk, Cormac, so um, well done for that. Uh, she asks, were the IFA taken by surprise by the Leinster secession and the establishment of the, the FAI? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question, and they, they actually were. Yeah, they, they, uh, they, um, there, ha there actually had been a split in 1912, of uh, most of the senior clubs had actually split from the um, um, IFA and had set up a rival new football association. Um, you had, had, had actually had pretty much the only uh, major clubs that didn't have were Linfield and Bohemians, and it was a real threat to uh, the IFA. Um, but they, they worked, you know, they worked it out um, um, eventually after a lot of months of rancor. Um, but the IFA had a lot of help from the uh, the British associations, from the FA, from the Scottish FA, and, and the, the Football Association of Wales. Um, and that helped them, you know, remain their uh, money, you know, their, their control of, of uh, Irish football. When, when the split happened in 21, it, it was a surprise. But they felt that was, it, was a minor, it was a minor matter and there'd be a squabble for a few months. And then the FAI realised they wouldn't have international recognition. You know, they, they would eventually uh, come back into, into the fold. Um, and then as it went on and they realised that, well, first of all, it was, it was uncertain whether Bohemians and Shelburne actually would join the FAI. Um, and, and it was only in late summer that actually both Bohemians and Shelburne decided they were going to go into the FAI. Um, and when they set up a football league and they set up the cup competitions, then the IFA realised, actually, this is serious. Yeah, they, they, they have left us, so we have to make some efforts to bring them back in. I can see that Julian Kelly has his hand up there. Are, are you looking to ask something there, Julian? How are you doing? Um Correct. That was a very interesting and, and, and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Thanks very much indeed. Okay. Um, as, a, as an Irish man who goes to Windsor Park to watch Ireland playing in, in international football matches, I, I'd be interested to understand if you saw my vision for the future in 20 years' time where Ireland play 
our matches in in Belfast and the Gaelic uh, football Gaelic uh, Athletic Association had their headquarters and, and major games in Dublin uh, and the Irish Rugby Union also held their their games in Dublin. Would would you see it as a a good thing that that soccer in in Ireland used Belfast as its base for its major occasions and international matches? Yeah, I, I think I'm very open to you know how like personally I'd love to see an All Ireland soccer team definitely it was and, and how that will work. Um, I, I certainly will be open to uh, you know. And maybe having alternate venues like there used to be alternate venues for rugby, for example. Um, you know, you used to have internationals in Lansdown Road and Ravenhill, um, all, up until the fifties. Um, yeah, look, I, I'm not sure. Look, you, you, it could be. Uh, would I don't know how many people Windsor Park will hold. So I think it's it's obviously it ha- would have to be redeveloped to hold a lot more people than it currently does. Um, I, I personally wouldn't have a huge problem with that myself. Obviously, we'd have to change flags. We'd have to change anthems. Um, but that, that that would have to come, and and that's what other sports have done. They've 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 kind of navigated that difficult kind of uh, emblems territory by trying to have like uh, um, on controversial emblems and flags and antics and so on. That. And 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 I, you know obviously venue would be an important thing as well. Now, uh, maybe some um, you know hardcore Dublin folk wouldn't want that. You know what we don't know that that could be an issue. But I know from different polls that have been done, most most support from. Uh, and from people of an All Ireland team comes from the south. Um, there's still as high numbers in the north, but it's more so from the south that there are higher numbers. So I think it's more influencing people in the north to join an All Ireland team, which which is a big obstacle, I think, than the south. Thanks, Cormac, and thanks for the question, Julian, as well. Uh, we'll maybe just do one more, uh, and then we'll let you go and uh, let you go and watch the rest of the match. Um, let me see, Bart or Barry? I'll pick Bart. Uh, so how, how were the delegates for the committees under the IFA chosen? Was it by the amount of clubs within an area or some other method? Would this explain the imbalance in the committees? Well, no, no, it wasn't. It, 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 was, it was kind of a, um, like the, the IFA council, the main governing authority had to, had to say, like so they, they would decide, and it was decided at annual general meetings, um, you know, who would be on each committee, you know, each year. Um, and you, you, it certainly wasn't, the, the, basically the, the size of the division was based on how many clubs were affiliated to the IFA. And Leinster actually overtook um, Antrim, um, which actually became the North East um, um, in 1913. But it still had far fewer people on the subcommittees and the IFA overall governing body than Leinster. So it certainly wasn't based on the number of clubs within each area. Um, it, it, look, it, it, it actually came down to um, you know the, the control authority, the IFA governing body, and I wouldn't say it was a closed shop, but but a def- definitely people closer to Belfast had more input than uh, than people further away. Thanks very much, Cormac. Well, look, folks, that brings us to the end of the session. Uh, thanks again to Cormac for for taking the time out to be with us tonight. Thanks to everybody in the audience for taking the time uh, to join us this evening. This event has been recorded. It's going to be placed, I hope, on the Linden Hall Library's YouTube channel over the next few days. Um, so just in the meantime, you can you can head to the YouTube channel and you can catch up on all of the online events, really, that we've done over the past year. And we'll be doing plenty more of these types of online events in the coming months. You can, you can uh, f- find out the next ones on the Linden Hall Library website. So that's all for me, folks. Um, I'm just going to bring the session to a close now um, and I'll see you all hopefully in the very near future at a Lennon Hall Library event. Take care. Thanks, Jason.